Hi everyone, welcome to THT and today I would like to review the top 16 uh, deck list from the Take the Initiative uh, Top Cut uh, online tournament. So why do I pay attention to this uh, online tournament in particular? Simply because I believe that this tournament has the highest level of play at least for now. And uh, the reason for this is multiple. First of all, because it's happening online, it doesn't have any geographical limitations. All the best players from all over the world can compete against one another. Uh, secondly, uh, it's a, a tournament that has a, lit a little bit of prestige because um, it's been there for even before the game came out. Uh, people have been competing on this league uh, for a few months now, even before the release of the game. Uh, so a lot of uh, good players are aware that this league exists and usually compete in this, um, in this tournament. And uh, the third reason is that, obviously from my own experience, having played uh, on this league, also have been uh, watching games on this league, it's, it is the highest uh, level of play that I've seen personally. Uh, I've basically watched every single tournament that uh, have been broadcasted. And uh, personally, I find this that the, the level of play in this tournament is, is pretty high. Uh, and quite a bit higher than what we have in real life. In real life, a lot of people still kind of learning the game, uh, getting used to the cards, and uh, I think that obviously as time goes by and as we're going to see a real um, uh, OP structure from FFG with official tournaments from FFG and maybe even bigger tournaments with uh, uh, a bigger ca cash price, uh, obviously the, the real life tournament will, will become more prestigious and more important and will also have a higher level of play. But currently, we're still very early on in the lifespan of the game, and currently, I don't think that's the case. Uh, this is why I'm looking. Uh, I'm going to be looking at this tournament very closely, and uh, and this is why I'm I'm going to do a little bit of an analysis on the different decks that are are, are competing. So I'm going to review the top 16, uh, and every single list in this top 16. So first of all, a little overview on the meta. So another thing also to important. Uh, to keep in mind for this for this uh, top cut tournament is that the way it works is that um, uh, only the top 16 of the league get to participate in that tournament. So players uh, who played are basically playing about eight games on average. And uh, in order to make it to the top cut, you need to do honestly the the I think the at worst you need to do something along the line of a 6-2, like a 5-3 or 6-2. I think. I don't know if there's anybody at 5-3 who managed to qualify, but I think that I think the minimum is a 6-2. And a lot of players are 7-1, some players are 8-0. Uh, so you really need to have a very good track record to even participate in this in this uh, in this top cut. So it's um I would say as I said, for all those reasons combined, I think it is the highest level of play you're gonna see in Star Wars Unlimited, at least for now. So without further ado, let's go into up in the list. So I'm gonna start by the number one. So number one is competing with the the one right next to him. So that's the first uh, uh, that's the first um, round of 16. That's the first game. The second game would be this one, and so on. So here first we have the list of you can call me Al, which is who is a very good uh, aggro player. And to, uh, for this top cut, he decided to play uh, Cunning Bo uh, Boba. Uh, which, as you know, is the strongest double aspect deck in the game, uh, and a deck that is very close in, in power level to the Boba Green. Uh, yes, you don't have the ramp and all the strong uh, red-black cards, but you have very powerful double uh, cunning cards. And so I'm not going to talk about the list in detail, because obviously I've made a, a very detailed video uh, about this, this, uh, this archetype, so I'm just going to talk about the thing that I find interesting about this particular version. So first of all, the first thing that jumped into my mind is the uh, is the uh, Outer Rim Headhunter, which has been widely considered to be a relatively weak card. Um, in this case, I think it makes sense for two reasons. First of all, it gives you a bit of a better balance between the ground and the, the space. Whenever you are trying to be aggressive, you're trying to have uh, a balanced amount of space and air units, so then you can arena dodge the opponent. So having more uh, uh, space unit al allow you to arena dodge a little bit easier. And the second advantage of uh, Outer Rim and Hunter is like it gives you more vehicle, which makes the uh, Frontier RTRT more consistent. And Frontier RTRT is has been uh, kind of a 
has been establishing himself as the best four drop option for this deck uh, now. So it's a deck that it's a card that is relatively powerful. So outside of the headhunter, the main deck is relatively classic. We see one copy of uh, Change of Art, which is not a lot, especially there's no Change of Art in the sideboard, which is a bit more surprising. Um, the sideboard is a bit in is interesting. You can also play ISB agent. I'm not sure in against what is really playing that because I don't feel like ISB agents is particularly well positioned in the current meta. But the rest of the deck really makes a lot of sense. It's a pretty classic Boba Liz. It has all the powerful double aspect card you, you you're going to expect, and it's going to be of course a very uh, tempo focused list. I love the presence of the mining guild Tie Fighters as well to give yourself some 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 card draw and also make the Frontier Territory even more consistent. You can go for the double one drop opening, which is very card intensive, but can be very powerful. And then later on in the game, you can redraw your card with a uh, mining uh, uh, TIE Fighter if you get to that point. Um, he's going to be facing uh, Jonah Niklas, who is playing uh, Boba, uh, sorry, uh, Han Green. Uh, as you know, I'm a massive fan of Han Green. He's, my, he's been my favorite leader to play uh, so far in the game. And this version is extremely close to the one I run. Basically, uh, he's, he's basically playing... Um, so, compared to the, the list that I've been uh, showing to the to people on my channel, that um, he's basically playing one less Chewbacca with a change of heart. And I think he's playing one less Akbar for a Spark of Rebellion. And the rest of the list is exactly identical to my version. He's also playing the Echo Base instead of the energy conversion lab so this version is very close in the main deck at least is extremely close to what I'm playing so I'm, 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 I'm suspecting that uh, uh, Niklas has been uh, looking at my videos and that's why he came up with this uh, very close version and uh, I think this is a very strong list I think uh, 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 Anne Green is an extremely powerful leader if played correctly uh, in the league, I've been playing uh, Han Green personally almost exclusively, and I came out with a 7-1 record. And my other friend, Dylan, who has also been playing Han Green with the exact same version, also been going 7-1. Uh, so he's been very successful. I don't know if Niklas was playing uh, Han Green during the qualifiers, uh, during the uh, during the, the league, uh, to qualify to this tournament, so I don't know if he did. I'm assuming he did, in which case there would be at least three players who went Han Green and went very successful with the deck which I think shows that the deck has the legs. Uh, my my only pro problem with this deck is obviously the fact that it's not great against Han because Han and, uh, sorry, against Boba because Boba has so many ways to prevent you from 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 going to uh, to 5 to 7. Basically the idea of this deck is you come out uh, on turn 4 with 5 resources, you use Han to get a 6 resources, then you summon Han, then you attack with Han, you get 7 resources, and you can play either a U-Wing reinforcement or a Han solo. And there's so many, uh, and most decks cannot really do much against that, because th most decks cannot uh, uh, kill a unit that has six, uh, a leader that has six HP, uh, in one in one hit, um, or they need to require a very specific tool like Steadfast Battalion, which can be played around. But um, Boba is one of the few decks who not only ha has multiple answers against that. They it can they can barrage you, they can play No Good to Me Dead. If they can play, um, um, and they could also do the steadfast battalion thing. So, it's um, it makes it very difficult to use. And they they can also surprise strike with 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 Boba. They have really a lot of ways to to counter that, which makes playing Han very difficult against Boba. So if you're playing Boba against Han, you re, uh, against, uh, if you're playing Han against Boba, you really have to play very differently uh, in order to make that work. Um, other than this, is uh, so the sideboard is interesting as well. Um, he's playing some of the same card that I'm playing, but he's also playing a couple of interesting differences here. A Greedo, for example, in the sideboard, maybe against Agro, um, uh, and the overwhelm uh, out of aspect overwhelm barrage, which I think can really take people by surprise. I think as a one of this card makes a lot of sense. I'm not sure in what matchup you would want that. Probably way too slow for Agro. As sev at seven, but um, probably in other matchup, maybe on the against Boba, it's it's a good idea. I'm not sure. I I, I would have I never tried it myself, uh, but that's some interesting uh, tech that. He, but overall, the deck is very similar to one, the one I'm running, and it's ve obviously very powerful. So here, um, this matchup, I think uh, Al is going to be favorite on this on this matchup. Uh, as I said, Boba Yellow has just so many ways uh, to prevent Boba from going for the double ramp, and if he cannot ramp. 
do the double ram turn with with and the deck is a lot less explosive and you need explosivity you need speed whenever you're fighting against a deck that can race you so hard between the um uh between the um the the the, the fire spray another problem that happens uh is that the boba yellow version specifically has a lot of ways to bounce your units so a lot of ways to to waylay your units back into your hand and that's a very big problem because Han typically is going to do card disadvantage in order to put cards into play. Uh, so, for example, you're going to spend an extra resource in order to to spend an extra card in order to play, let's say, a Chewbacca one turn earlier uh, or a Han one turn earlier. And then if you're going to just bounce them, then you not only are you losing the unit, but you're also losing the resources you invested. So, Waylay's effects are very powerful against against Han in general, and uh, Boba Cunning has plenty of them, which is a, usually a big problem for the deck. Uh, it's a bad matchup, but it's not an unwinnable matchup. I've managed to won win series against very good players playing Han Green, so I'll be interested to see how that how that plays out. But definitely not a great matchup on paper for the Han deck. Uh, next, we got Tower Number Nine playing. Uh, um, sorry, it's a bit laggy. Uh, yeah, no idea why it's so laggy. Anyway, we're just going to talk about the list uh, from a distance. Right? So as you can see, he's playing Shirut Red. Uh, so uh, pretty much he's playing the exact same version uh, that we've been expecting, which is a very force focus. Uh, he's playing the full uh, Jedi package with Obi Wan, Luke, uh, the three Jedi's lightsaber, the three the Force is with me, three Yoda, three Force throw. So and uh, two it binds all things. So very very focused on the Jedi package uh, more than any other version I've played I've seen before. So it's a it's a deck that is focused on the idea of getting out Shirut. Uh, Shirut is a very interesting leader because he cannot uh, really be killed unless a very specific card like for example Takedown. But uh, outside of Takedown there's almost no card that can one-shot Shirut when it comes out. Uh, even if you barrage it, it's going to take tons of damage but it only will die at the end of the turn. Uh, which uh, gives you plenty of time to play 4th throw, so he's one of the best force enablers in the game. And Full Throw is an incredibly powerful card that not only discard but uh, uh, um, kill enemy units. Um, so it's a very it's a mid range deck, right? It can it can play aggro because it has the A wing uh, Sabine package uh, that can be supported by Fleet Lieutenant's wing leader, and it has a relatively strong late game with Luke Skywalker, Obi Wan, tons of cards that are meant to be countering uh, Redemption because it's a great counter to Boba and it's also a good card against aggro. Uh, great counter to fire spray specifically. Um, so it's a very cool deck. Um, personally, I don't think it's quite up to the power level of other decks. Uh, I and I haven't seen uh, this deck really do great performances, uh, despite being played by very good players. That's why I'm a little bit skeptical. This version is very proactive. As you can see, he's not really playing any removal as out of open fire in the main deck. Most of his removals are in the sidebar. So it's a really proactive version. So I'll be interested to see how that works out. Uh, the Kanan is also in the sidebar, which is an under, an, another interesting fight. I'm not personally a big fan of Kanan when you don't play Energy Conversion Lab because the card becomes very slow. So I understand the idea of putting Kanan in the sideboard. And if, with Shirut and Yoda, you have plenty of enough uh, Force Enablers to, to enable your fourth or early on in the game. So yeah, uh, be interesting to see if someone managed to crack the code on this deck and managed to make it work. Um, and uh, yeah, because it's a very cool deck, and um, and yeah, it has a very strong Shirut can be very strong in some situation. It gets out countered by other things, but it's very strong in some situations. So it's not a deck that I've talked about on my channel, but um, if you're interested in this deck, knowing more about this deck, uh, Wu, so W with five O did a very good uh, deck tech on it. Uh, and Tower Number Nine himself has his own YouTube channel as well, uh, an excellent content creator that I encourage to check it out. Uh, next we got uh, Stubbly also playing uh, Shirut, but as you can see a very different choice, a, a very different uh, uh, take on the deck with uh, a lot less focus on the on the high hand, playing a couple of removals, a lot more defensive with the Saturn Patrol Craft and the, and the, the removals, no, uh, the fourth is with me goes in the sideboard. Um, and even plays Devotion, which is a very interesting card, I've never seen that card being played in Shirut. I mean, it makes sense on Shirut. She would really like upgrades because he likes to uh, take a ton of damage and then basically uh, uh, save himself by playing card that will boost his his HP. 
Um, and um, yeah, and uh, then this is a way of course, of course, to get to heal consistently with ag against aggro. So, be interesting to see how that works out for this version. Uh, unfortunately, there's going to be at least one Shiru. Uh, so the Shiru, those two Shiru decks are going to be facing each other on the top on the top 16. So unfortunately, only one of them will make it to the top eight. Uh, with that being said, that means that we have guarantee have a Shibut in the top eight, which is kind of cool. Um, and we'll see how they perform. I think uh, they will have to play against the winner between uh, Niklas and Call Me Hal. And I think, uh, and we'll see how that pays out when once they they are facing other, others. But that's going to be very some very interesting matchup for sure. And then we got SIP, uh, which um, is a is a friend of mine, a, a Polish player, an excellent player. He came out second on the Polish. Uh, tournament, but he was playing a budget version of Boba Fett without uh, um, Darth Vader, and as you can see here, is going uh, full strength uh, with uh, the proper version that plays uh, Darth Vader. So this is obviously as good as it gets. He's one of the best Boba Green pilots in, I believe, in the world, at least that I know of. Uh, he's also an excellent. Um, so we'll see. We'll see how that works out. Uh, for him, he's also the former winner. Is the is the person who won the last Top Cut tournament. So um, obviously a big favorite here for for him to take it again, uh, especially since he's going with his with his Boba Green. As you can see, uh, his sideboard is almost entirely dedicated in uh, to fight against control. Uh, control. He's basically not interested. He has some anti-aggro card in the main deck with the Constant Star Viper, but as you can see, he's not playing No Good To Me Dead, he's not playing Shoot First, which are two cards which are very good against aggro, and he's going, uh, he's basically saying, well, the aggro matchup is already a good matchup, so I'm just not going to focus on it, and I'm going to focus on, contr um, on going against control. So he's, he, the entire sideboard is basically dedicated to fight control, which is very interesting. Uh, we'll see how that works out for him. Um, it, We'll see how that works out for me. I'm not sure that's exactly the right call for this meta because I think there's only one Krennic deck in the meta. There's only one, uh, so that's obviously not a very favorable uh, meta for um, uh, for a deck like for a cyborg like this. Uh, but obviously it's Boba Green, right? So it's 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 very solid, and the main deck is just perfectly well played. Something I would say is the I SIP is not a big fan of No Good to Me Dead. And uh, I've seen him playing less and less copies of No Good to Me Dead. As a hand player, it makes me very happy because the less No Good to Me Dead, the better it is for my <laughs> for my hand. Uh, but um, it could be once again, if he's expecting control decks, it's a, it's probably a good call to not play No Good to Me Dead. Um, in this case, though, it's not exactly great for him because he's going to be facing Ryan Warner, and Ryan has his as his uh, as his own YouTube channel as well called Rebel Resource. He is probably the, the most dedicated Sabine Yellow player I've ever seen. I've seen in the game, so he he, he plays a lot uh, this Sabine Yellow. Uh, even though a lot of people have pivoted in, uh, towards Sabine Green recently. Uh, personally, I think Sabine Yellow used to be the strongest version of Sabine, and then uh, some later spoilers uh, before the game releases basically tilted the archetypes towards green, and people realize how strong uh, L energy, Con energy Conversion Lab was even on an aggro archetype. Uh, but uh, until then, uh, but um, Ryan still kept playing, uh, kept playing the, the the yellow version, and uh, we'll see how that works out for him. So technically, uh, aggro is not a great matchup for for Boba. With that being said. Uh, um, um, SIP, as you can see, is not playing No Good To Be Dead, he's not playing Shoot First. He's also a really strong car card against aggro. So his version is really, and he has zero sideboard card against aggro either. So it, it, maybe there's hope for Ryan to win this. Uh, Ryan is also a very good player, he knows his deck inside out, and someone who knows his deck is always very dangerous. Uh, his version of the deck is uh, pretty much what you would expect. One of the main advantages of playing uh, Sabine uh, Yellow is the access of Surprise Strike, which is one of the strongest finishers in the game, uh, alongside Million Falcon, which is another excellent finisher. So you got um, some very strong cards. Um, also, Greedo is, is, a, is a good card, even though it doesn't synergize right away with, uh, with uh, four cards, I believe in. But the rest of the deck is pretty much what you would expect. You also see Rogue Operative, which I think is a very, uh, which I think is a decent card in this deck. It's a card that, that attacks for. It's a Almost a 4-4-3. I think it, at the very least, I think it's it's fair to say that it's better than 
than Fighter for Freedom uh, for a three drop. Fighter for Freedom is actually not played at all in this deck, interestingly, and I and I think this is the right call to play Rogue Operative over over um, um, over Fighter uh, for Freedom. I think Rogue Operative is just slightly better, generally speaking. Um, I could be wrong, and um, I think if you're playing, yeah, yeah, I could be wrong, but I think um, uh, Fighter for Freedom just sounds better, better. Also, this version does not play that many red units, as you can see. Uh, Leia is also a great addition. It's a, it's a, it's either two two for one or something that exhausts for two, so it makes the deck a little bit more interactive. Also, plays Pack of Rebellion in the in the main deck. I'm not sure how good is Pack of Rebellion in the Nago deck. I think it's a um, it's a it's a big gamble if you can take out something like a barrage or a very important card of your opponent's hand, then it's amazing. Uh, but if you can't take out something very important, then you've wasted a lot of time. Uh, uh, you've wasted a lot of tempo, and this could have been a unit that could have been on the battlefield. Uh, so it's a, it's a bit dangerous, but I think it's a strong late game card, late game card for the Agro deck to to take out the the. Uh, so yeah, I'm 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 not sure exactly how powerful that is. Would be interesting to find out how successful that is. They also knows to play Dodona, that he likes very much. I think Dodona is a very solid card in some situations, so it's a nice option to have. We we'll see even the sneak attack going in the sideboard, which is interesting. Sneak attack is very good, uh, good with K2SO, and can be good with other things as well. But it's mostly for K2SO, I would say. Um, yeah, the rest of the deck just um, is pretty much what you would expect from from this color combination. You you can see him playing the 30 HP base. Uh, something I'm starting to realize more and more is that unless you were you are playing, uh, basically the the 30 HP base has considered to be better than Jeda City. Jeda City has been widely considered to be a pretty a, a, a base that was not worth the 5 HP that you're giving up for it. Uh, so yeah, people more and more have been, have been playing the, uh, the 30 HP base instead. Um, so on the next, so between those two, SIP is obviously the favorite because Boba Green. <laughs> uh, but Ryan has, has, a, has a shot. He's a very good aggro player and he knows his deck inside out. And uh, and Ryan, uh, sorry, and uh, SIP has a version that is relatively that pretty, almost ignore the, the aggro matchup. The only anti-aggro card is, that he's really playing is Star Viper, which could have an impact on the on the on the on the matchup. Next, we got Astrotech. So Astrotech is also an excellent Boba Green player. He actually won two uh, consecutive uh, top cut tournaments, uh, and I think he's the only one who managed to win two of them. So uh, he's a uh, he's obviously an excellent player, and uh, he's uh, also been playing almost. Boba Green almost exclusively. I've never seen him playing anything else than Boba Green, and Boba Green being the best deck, that obviously puts all the strengths on this side. So, the main deck is relatively classic. It's actually very close to my version of the deck. Uh, I think you remove the Star Viper, you put the side Star Viper in the sideboard, you add a No Good to Me Dead, and that's pretty much my deck. Uh, yeah, you had you had one No uh, one No Good to Me Dead, and you had one uh, Viper Pro Droid, and I think that's that's my deck. Yeah, it's. A, Oh, you're also playing only two Bosk. Oh yeah, I would also play one less battalion, one more Bosk. Interesting that he's only playing two copies of Bosk. In but yeah, uh, the two Traitorous. I love Traitorous. It's really good, especially in the mirror match. Um, so really love that. Um, but yeah, only two Bosk is uh, is interesting because it's it's gonna make his his big turn Boba turn a, a little bit less consistent. I mean, he does have a battalion though, uh, so obviously that there's that. But if he doesn't have his seal available for battalion, then it's gonna be a little bit awkward. Uh, but I'm, I'm guessing he's going to keep uh, uh, EC Alpha Battalion very consistently. Uh, the sideboard is uh, relatively classic, except the three copies of Cunning, so fully committed to the uh, Cunnings, which he has to pay 6-4. That's a lot of resources uh, for the Cunning. I, I I don't know in what matchup you would want to bring bring this. I've never played 6 resource Cunning, so I don't know how good this card is uh, in this particular deck when you pay 6 resources for it. Uh, so it'll be interesting how that performs, interesting to know. And uh, he's has some... Astrotech has been one of the first players to play the Emperor's Legions in the sideboard uh, to fight against Control. And since then, he's never removed them. So I think this card is way too situational, personally. But we'll see if he managed to do well in, in there. Probably not going to play it a lot because there's simply not a lot of people playing Control in this meta, in this in this tournament. He's going to be playing Cthul, so if you remember guys, Cthul is the person who inspired me to for the Grand Inquisitor green deck uh, that, I've showed on my, uh, that I've shown on my channel. I think it's a very legit deck, 
and it's in my opinion the best Guanacuisto deck by far. Uh, so uh, Kotul is going to put this deck to the test in, uh, on the most competitive stage that we have right now, and we'll see how it performs. So his version is uh, quite a bit different from mine. He does not play ECL, he plays Command Center, uh, which is not a crazy choice uh, because Grand Inquisitor with his ability has the ability to uh, uh, ready units. So the importance of having of giving ambush to your to your unit is not as big of a deal. Um, the rest of the deck he plays, as you can see, he's also playing Admiral Ozzel to be able to, to play his unit ready. So he's going to have plenty of, of chances to put his unit ready and playing the, the command center allows him to have a better matchup against aggro. So that's quite nice. Um, he plays a lot of Rook and the rest of the deck is, is relatively similar to, to what I've been showing. He's also playing one copy of Force Lightning. Um, but yeah, as you can see, he's playing a, a version that is relatively similar to, to what I've been running. Uh, there's a few differences, but the, the 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 main idea is there. So I encourage you, of course, to watch my video about uh, Grand Inquisitor Green to get more details on how this this deck operates. Uh, so uh, so that was going to be Kotul against Astrotech. So obviously, as much as I I love this this Grand Inquisitor Green deck, Astrotech is going to be the favorite on this match, of course. And here we got uh, Breaker playing as Boba Green. Uh, so Boba Green, um, Boba is the is the only deck. Uh, so Breaker is actually the only player who managed to take a game off me during the during the qualifiers. Uh, uh, so he's he's a very good player. Here he's playing, of course, the the Boba Green. And there's a couple of interesting things about this list. Uh, once again, we'll see the 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 the, the players playing cunning uh, for six resources here. So one cunning in the main, one cunning in the sideboard. And once again, we'll see the No Good To Me Dead being progressively removed here too in the sideboard instead of in the main deck. Uh, so very interesting. And uh, uh, we'll see the rest of the list is, is relatively classic. We see a split between Season Short Trooper and Viper Prodoid, which I really like because it depends on the matchup. Viper Prodoid is better against aggro, Short Trooper is better against control decks. So having a split between the two makes a lot of sense to me depending on, on what you draw. Um, I think it's quite good, and um, now the rest of the deck is fairly classic, so we'll see how I perform with this, and once again, I'm really excited to see how good Cunning for 6 is, because that seems to be the new trend here for uh, for uh, Boba players. He's going to be facing a Lego Pizza, who is playing a red aggro deck, so this is one of the few players that I do not know, uh, so one of the newest players in the league. He's playing a very interesting a red boba uh, boba deck with the sneak attack but only two copies of sneak attack uh, there's a as you can see boba red is is as the reputation of being the strongest uh, aggro uh, villainy decks in the game uh, can really come out very explosive with um, stormtroopers and 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 Greedo on turn one um, and um, and really put a lot of pressure on you and then finish you off with a fire spray a couple of very odd things in this list that I, I really strongly disagree with. First of all, where is um, Ruthless Raider? Ruthless Raider is one of the strongest uh, six drop finisher that you can play in this deck. It comes out, deal direct damage to the base. It's an excellent combo with sneak attack. So for me, playing uh, a, a villainy um, aggression deck uh, with a sne uh, with sneak attack without Raider is a bit criminal to me. Like I don't really understand why you wouldn't want to take that opportunity because it's such a powerful combo. Uh, another thing that I strongly disagree with is the um, is the lack of ASB agent. So I'm not a big fan of ASB agent in general, but in this particular deck, its ASB agent is is really really strong. Because what you can do is that you your opponent start with a two drop. You can play ASB agent, ping the enemy uh, the enemy unit, and then finish it off using Tarkin Town. Then use Boba's ability to untap a resources, and then you can play either a two drop or two additional one drop. So you can literally play three one drop on turn one and kill the opponent unit. Uh, and and this is a start doing all this on turn one give you such a massive lead uh, that it allows you to put a lot of pressure on the opponent. And then you usually try to finish the game with your fire sprays, with your boba turn when the boba turn comes around, puts a ton more pressure on the opponent, 
And and it's a very, very, very powerful thing. And in my opinion, that's the main reason to play red. And because he doesn't play Ice B Agent, he's not going to have that opportunity in this deck. So, um, yeah, so I'm not exactly sure what to make of this deck. There's a lot of things that I disagree with. Uh, but obviously he plays the Fundamentals, he plays the Bobas, he plays the Fire Spray, he plays the Bosk, he plays the Surprise Strike. So um, it's 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 a very strong deck and we'll see how that performs here. Here in this matchup I would give the advantage to Breaker, obviously. And we'll see how that goes. Uh, next we got, uh, this is going to be a Boba Mirror between Ippo and, and Vika. So here we see uh, Ippo with his... Uh, very classic version of, of Boba. I like the split between Bosk and and Cantina, uh, and um, and uh, Syndicate Lackeys. I really don't know which one of the two is better. Honestly, it really depends on a lot of factors. So having a split between the two is nice because then if you happen to draw two, you have the choice which one you want to keep depending on the on the on the matchup. So I like this a lot. Only two copies of Boba Fett is the only odd thing about this list. Uh, not sure exactly why he went down to only two copies. Uh, I still think Boba the Greater is, is an amazing card. But the rest of the deck makes a lot of sense. We're really starting to see the Traitorous being a mainstay in the Boba decks, which I'm, I'm really pleased about because it's a kind of a prediction I made. I think Traitorous is, is just an amazing card. So I'm um, uh, really happy to see people adopting it. And once again, we're seeing the trend of people playing less No Good To Me Dead. No Good To Me goes in the sideboard. Next we got Vika, and Vika is playing a much more uh, old school version of the deck. As you can see, the Nobu no Dead are in the main deck. Uh, once again, we'll see the Traitorous, the Reinforcement Walker in the main deck, that will help notably in the mirror. That can very that can be very helpful in the mirror match. Um, and uh, I think the main originality of his version is that he's playing uh, the Cattle Spacer. Uh, in the sideboard instead of playing them in the main deck. Uh, I don't think it's a big problem because he's playing both Constant Star Vipers and, and Defender. The risk is to not have enough board presence in space early on, but I think since he's playing those two cards, he should be fine. Uh, we'll see how that performs here with the with the Cattle Spacer in the sideboard here. I'll be interesting to see how that works out. Uh, next we got Dylan. Dylan is one of one of my friends. I've been playing him with, with him a lot. He he played Hand Green throughout the entire league and he did very well with him. He went with a 7-1 record uh, with this deck. But for the tournament himself, for the for the top cut himself itself, he decided to go for Koenig Green and he's actually the only control uh, real the the control green player in the in the tournament. We, there's no Aiden at all in the in the meta, which is very surprising to me. Uh, because I think Control is, is pretty well positioned in the meta right now. It does pretty decent against contr uh, against Boba. And it does pretty good against Aggro. So um, I think it's a I think it's a good choice. Uh, his deck is relatively classic. Is really what you would expect uh, from a list like that. He's playing the full uh, Pursuer. He, he decided to play the Pursuer over the Season Troll Trooper. Which is a bit surprising. I found it also only two copies of Inferno 4. Which is also a little bit surprising. Uh, but after this, it's pretty, it's pretty classic. We see one copy of the Juggernaut. We see the the Avenger. One copy of Blast in the main. One in the sideboard, which I, I really like as well. Uh, the Vigilance on the sideboard, probably for the mirror control, because Vigilance uh, milling can be very, very decisive uh, in control mirror. Even if you have to pay six for it. Um, it's also a very good card against Agro, but not maybe maybe not at six resources. So we'll see how, where... I think it's... Pro, most likely anti-control in this very specific, in this very specific matchup. So yeah, pretty classic version of the car of the deck. Uh, pretty classic version of the uh, of the deck overall, and uh, we'll see how, how well it does. He's going to be facing Poem uh, on this first round. So Poem is um, uh, went in the final in the last tournament, and he's has been one of the biggest innovators as far as that running Boba Yellow. And he's once again going to continue to innovate here with this Boba Yellow, not settling with uh, the previous innovation that he made on the deck and once again going for something different this time around. Uh, the, the, the Headhunter, we're seeing this again. I think this makes a lot of sense, makes the SERG more consistent, gives you a bit of a more of a split between the ground and the space. So this I understand quite well. Uh, however, there's a couple of things which I find to be a little bit odd, and we'll see. Um, first of all, the Bib Fortuna 
for me is very surprising. I don't think Bibo Fortuna is good in an, uh, because he's not it's not very aggressive at all. It's very passive. Like in a, in the deck that's supposed to be aggressive, uh, having a one attack unit doesn't seem to be very impactful. And yes, you can play your even cheaper, but I don't think it's particularly impactful in a deck like this. So we'll see on that performance, but yeah, maybe it's just to have a unit that's just very difficult to get rid of, just something that sticks on the board that you can use buffs buffs on. Maybe that's that's what he wants to do. And then he also plays Starfing Gunship. I do not like Starfing Gunship. I think it's very slow. Uh, comes to play on turn three, doesn't have any immediate impact on the game, and then it's relatively situational because you really need to have unit that you can kill with it. Three attack doesn't really kill that all that much. Uh, I think Gunship is just very slow, and and it's also kind of a control card. While really Boba wants to be an uh, Boba Yellow specifically wants to be an aggressive deck. So yeah, there's a lot of things I don't really understand. We, uh, uh, however, I'm really happy that he returned into playing three surprise track in the main, uh, which is was a big disagreement that I with him on this previous list, and he also played the the body work in the main as well. So his version seems to be a little bit more uh, balanced. Maybe it's it's meant to be. Uh, a bit more balanced than this previous situation, which I think I like quite a bit. Uh, also, in the sideboard, so it, it, also Poem is a person who likes to tailor his deck compared to his opponent. One of the particularities of this tournament is like you know who you're going to be playing against. So maybe he, he, he knew he was going to be playing against Control, so maybe that's why you're playing the, the Emperor's Legion out of Aspect, which is probably one of the another very surprising thing. I have no idea if this card can be any good. Uh, in this matchup, uh, when it's played out of aspect, um, uh, we'll see how that, how that pays out. Um, so yeah, once again, uh, lots of things I I am a bit uh, skeptical about, but uh, poem is always has this this ability to to surprise me, uh, and some of the choices end up making a lot more sense as I see them in motion. I don't agree with everything he. There, there's some stuff that I just simply definitely disagree with, and I and I think he, he, he returned back to it. But there's some stuff that that he he made me change my mind on a lot of things. So we'll see how that how that works out with for him. And uh, this matchup is is a pretty balanced matchup. I feel like uh, the body work in the main is going to be tremendously uh, useful. So with the, I think it could it could go either way. Those two players are really good players anyway. So I think it could go either way. Next, we got my list uh, and my deck. I'm playing Han Solo uh, Green, not because I think it's the strongest deck right now, but just because it's it's a, it's the deck that I like to pilot. And and, f and for me, the 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 main purpose of those tournament is to put those decks to the test and to see how they perform in a very competitive environment. And uh, since there is nothing at stake, you don't really win anything for those tournaments. I prefer to to learn something rather than trying to win at all cost. And in this case, I've decided to bring something that maybe does not give me as many chances to win that if I would have bring something like a Boba Green, but is going to allow me to learn a lot more about uh, the capabilities of this deck. Obviously, it's a deck that I know inside out. It's a deck that I've played a lot, so I'm not coming here. Uh, I'm coming here with the expectation that I'm going to be able to do quite well with this deck. Uh, so only differences compared to the original version that I had that I posted on my channel is that I'm playing Syndicate Lackeys instead of uh, uh, one copy of Chewbacca and the other copy of Chewbacca has been turned into a Vanguard Ace. So two Vanguard Ace allows me to get the Vanguard Ace combo with U-Wing Reinforcement a bit more consistently without damaging the consistency of the deck. Syndicate Lackeys, I just find this card to be more useful than Chewbacca most of the time. Very good against the B, notably very good against Boba Disintegrator. So this is what I've been uh, I've been looking to try, and uh, it's been going pretty well for me. So the rest of the deck is pretty much exactly as you know it. So if you want more details about this deck, just go check out my video on Han Green. And uh, my opponent is going to be Copycat99, and he's playing uh, the Grand Army of Thrall Blue Control deck. Uh, which is probably the, the wildest deck in this tournament, to be honest. It's probably the, the deck that I think is a little bit the, the more outside of the meta uh, that, that we've seen. Uh, it's a very control -y deck, very slow. Um, it's a deck that I don't think... I, I, that I think can be very powerful if you know how to play with Thrawn very well. Be able to, to check uh, the opponent's top of the deck. Uh, so he has the, the the regional governor that can you can see what your opponent is gonna draw and then you can play regional governor name that card 
This can be very powerful. Uh, we got Greedo. Once again, Greedo can be very powerful when you're able to predict what is on, going to be on top of the deck. Then you know if this is going to deal the extra plus two or not. Uh, Bifortuna makes a lot more sense in this deck than it does in an aggro deck because it sticks to the battlefield and it allows you to to uh, to play your super laser blast for cheaper. It's going to be very uh, very uh, useful. No good to me dead. Very excellent. Very good card against me. Uh, and uh, very good at slowing down the game. And the rest of the deck really makes a lot of sense. It's very blue dominated, so you can play Luton and Charleston, uh and get him as a 5 5 relatively consistently, not systematically, but consistently. A couple of oddities, notably with the Luke out of aspect. Um, one of thing that one of the big weakness of Throne Blue is like it's a deck that doesn't have a lot of late game. Basically, all you have in late game traditionally is Avenger and uh, Super Laser Blast. Uh, which is strong, but not as strong as the late game you're going to get if you're playing green, like compared to having stuff like Reinforce More Walker, uh, Vader, Devastator, that kind of thing. Um, so he plays a look out of aspect, which I don't know how good that is. I'll be very interesting to see how that pans out for him. I cannot imagine this being any good, but we'll see. There's also Vision out of aspect, which is probably here to mill the opponents. This is a very controlly, very slow deck, so the mill from Visions can matter. Uh, that's my assumption. And that's why he's also playing a restock in the sideboard and additional copies of Vigilance as well. So really uh, playing for the control mirror in terms of in terms of meal. He also plays additional copies of Chimera, which I'm assuming is is for the control matchup as well. Chimera is traditionally just extremely in incredibly slow and difficult to, to use. Um, but maybe in control it's not terrible. Uh, maybe in the control mirror it's not completely terrible. Anyway, it's gonna be interesting. He's definitely playing an interesting deck. And yeah, so the overall meta, as I said earlier, 8 Boba, 2 Shiru, 2 Han, 1 Throne, 1 Krennic, 1 Sabine, 1 GI. So people might be surprised by the, the few numbers of Sabine. I'm not surprised by, by this at all. I think Sabine is very much a very, um, a very poorly positioned in the current meta. And I believe that it doesn't do particularly well against Boba, nor does it do particularly well against Control. Um, at least the way people have been building that control deck so far, which is very anti-aggro. Um, and uh, all those those things means that it's very difficult to play Sabine in that environment. Um, uh, so yeah, the the so I'm not surprised at all. Uh, I'm a bit more surprised though to not see more Iden decks. I was expecting to see more control decks, only two control decks, and one of them being uh, being uh, being a Thrawn deck. So only one traditional uh, green, black, blue deck. Um, so people might be wondering because people are not really competing for money in this tournament. They're not really gaining anything outside of the, just the prestige and just the knowledge. So what is the incentive to be running a good deck in, the, in this kind of tournaments and how competitive that is? As you can see, everybody is bringing a very competitive deck to the to the thing. So I think just by looking at the deck list, you have the answer to your question. It is a very competitive tournament that people are taking very seriously because you can see the deck list, right? You can see that everybody has brought a very strong deck. There's a couple of people who brought something a little bit out of the bush, uh, but most people brought a very strong deck. I brought a very strong deck as well, even though if I was comp going to compete for money, I would have probably brought a... Uh, uh, brought, uh, 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 Boba Green, but you don't want to see a tournament with only Boba Green, of course, so uh, it's more interesting when you learn more when there's a diverse meta where there's a lot of Boba Greens but they're going to be confronted to other decks so then you can see how uh, those decks are positioned relative to Boba Green so it's a very good testing environment because the majority play people of people play uh, meta decks but not everybody does, so th this allows you to see how those deck pairs against those those specific Bobas so I hope you find this this video informative. Um, uh, and uh, if you got any question, uh, feel free to ask them. And uh, uh, I might do a little report about the results of the tournament. Uh, and um, but uh, but I'm gonna leave it at that, and I'll tell you uh, how well I did uh, for this tournament. And until then, I'll see you next time. Uh, if you like the video, please uh, like and subscribe.